a reading from the book of Genesis. God said, let the water teem with an abundance of living creatures, and on the earth let birds fly beneath the dome of the sky. And so it happened. God created the great sea monsters and all kinds of swimming creatures with which the water teems, and all kinds of winged birds. God saw how good it was, and God blessed them, saying, Be fertile, multiply, and fill the water of the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came, and morning followed, the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth all kinds of living creatures, cattle, creeping things, and wild animals of all kinds. And so it happened. God made all kinds of wild animals, all kinds of cattle, and all kinds of creeping things of the earth. God saw how good it was. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the cattle, and over all the wild animals and all the creatures that crawl on the ground. God created man in his image. In the divine image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, saying, Be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things that move on the earth. God also said, See, I give you every seed-bearing plant all over the earth, and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit on it to be your food, and to all the animals of the land, the birds of the air, and all the living creatures that crawl on the ground, I give all the green plants for food. And so it happened. God looked at everything he had made, and he found it very good. Evening came, and morning followed the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all their array were completed. Since on the seventh day God was finished with the work he had been doing, he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had undertaken. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work he had done in creation. Such is the story of the heavens and the earth at their creation. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks, God. O Lord, our God, how wonderful your name in all the earth. How wonderful your name in all the When I behold your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is man that you should be mindful of him, or the son of man that you should care for him? You have made him little less than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him rule over the works of your hands, putting all things under his feet. All the sheep and oxen, yes, and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fishes of the sea, and whatever swims the paths of the seas.
Dominus Fobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum, When the Pharisees with some scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they observed that some of his disciples ate their meals with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees, and in fact all Jews, do not eat without carefully washing their hands, keeping the tradition of the elders. And on coming from the marketplace, they do not eat without purifying themselves. And there are many other things that they have traditionally observed purification of cups and jugs and kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and scribes questioned him, why do your disciples not follow the tradition of the elders but instead eat a meal with unclean hands? He responded, well did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines human precepts. You disregard God's commandment, but cling to human tradition. He went on to say, how well you have set aside the commandment of God in order to uphold your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever curses father or mother shall die. Yet you say, if someone says to father or mother, any support you might have had from me is korban, meaning dedicated to God. You allow him to do nothing more for his father or mother. You nullify the word of God in favor of your tradition that you have handed on, and you do many such things. Verbum Domini. This past uh, December 21st, if you were in North America, were you outside at uh, dusk or at the, at the end of the day looking to the southwest sky like I was? Do you remember that in the news, the convergence of Saturn and uh, Jupiter, that they were going to be so close together just one, one degree apart from the Earth, that they would appear as one great light in the sky. That's where I was looking, but it was cloudy, so I couldn't see it. But the next day I could, it was clear, they were further apart. But it's quite a remarkable thing that for hundreds of years they haven't been this close, and we won't see it again for a long time. And what that tells us, as someone has described the universe, as one giant clock. So you have all of these rotating planets and stars, you have all of these things, but that we can calculate that on December 21st in the year 2020, that there was gonna be this close convergence of Jupiter and Saturn. We could predict that because there's an order in the universe that we can see, that we can calculate, that we can know. In fact, it's because of the 
Judeo-Christian heritage, which was quite different from a lot of pagan philosophers. Pagan philosophers would say, well, it's all chaos. There's no order. There's no rhyme or reason for any of it. But the Judeo-Christian heritage, based on the book of Genesis and the creation accounts, said, no, it's been brought into being out of nothing by one who's made everything, who's found it all good. And in fact, it reflects something of an intelligence. You know, like science today will say, well, we got energy, we got mass, but there's something else here too. There's loads of information in everything that exists. Books and volumes of information of how they are to replicate and how they are to uh, continue in existence. We call that DNA is one of the elements of that. So where does information come from but from an intelligence? And so God created everything out of nothing, but he doesn't continue to do so. He put potentialities in that which he has created. Be fertile and multiply so things can reproduce and they can continue in existence. But all of this, as I said, that the Judeo-Christian heritage understood that there is an order to this universe and we can discover what that order is and that really led to the scientific method where we've had scientific advances because it's like, okay, we know there's a particular way that things operate, well, let's discover what that is. And so all these advances in healthcare and technology and all of that came from that understanding that there's an order, there's information, if you will, encoded in everything, and let's discover what that is, and then we can better help pay people in the healthcare industry, for example. So the book of Genesis, as we, as we begun yesterday, and the creation account, the first creation account, tells us that and it's speaking in a poetic way, a figurative way, and yet it's also expressing something real, something that really happened. As we have come to understand with the Hubble telescope and so on, that we can see that the universe is expanding. Well, if it's expanding, then there must have been a point when it all began. And it's fascinating too that when we're in this Milky Way galaxy, this huge galaxy, it's called the Milky Way, that many places in the galaxy, we would not be able to look out into the universe. It'd be too obscured. But we're in that precise position, one of the positions where we can observe the universe. We can have a telescope and we can look out in the universe. And so what did our, our psalm today, Psalm 8, say? When I behold your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is man that you should be mindful of him, the son of man that you should care for him? We heard on Sunday in the psalm that the Lord this is Psalm 147. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. He tells the number of the stars. He calls each one by its name. You know, I've looked at different um, explanations of how big the universe is, and some will say, well, it's 27, at least 27 billion light years across. Others, 90 billion light years across. You know how big a light year is? Speed of light is 300,000 miles per second. Add up all those seconds for one year. That's a lot of space. We can't comprehend it. Billions and billions of planets and stars. How awesome God is. And it reveals to us something of his awesomeness. And the only thing that really is reasonable to conclude 
is that there's someone who's beyond our comprehension, who has brought all of this incomprehensible universe, things beyond our grasp, into being. And to think of it that he calls each star by its name, and that follows he heals the brokenhearted. So he knows everything that exists. Jesus said that he knows even the sparrows that fall. But he also said, you're worth more than many sparrows. He knows every planet. He knows every star. He heals the brokenhearted. He knows you. Yes, there may be seven, eight, nine billion people on this earth, but he knows you. He knows you. He is that awesome God who is wisdom, power, goodness. And that's what we see, that everything he made is good. So the Judeo-Christian heritage says that creation is good. Not all previous philosophies held that. They said, well, material things are evil. The spiritual things are good. No, what we see in the Judeo-Christian heritage is that everything he made he found to be good. But we also see there's a hierarchy of being. And so today he's, he's uh, filling the seas, he's filling the earth. He blessed it he, and he, he gave a potentiality within them, be fertile and multiply. And so the waters are filled with these creatures. The earth is filled with these creatures. But then there's something different that happens. He's going to make something that's even greater than everything that's preceded it. He's going to make man in his image, in his divine image. He created him, male and female. He created them. I like something that St. Bonaventure says about how God has expressed himself. He expresses himself in his creation. And so all creatures have at least a trace of God. They, they tell us that I didn't make myself. And so they point to their creator, the rocks, the mountains, the hills, the birds, the fish, the animals. They're all saying I didn't make myself. I'm pointing toward the one who created me. So everything has a trace of God expressing himself. And he would say that this is a book, too, that we can read, looking at his creation, looking at the vastness of the universe. And we can understand something of the one who has made it, just like we look at an artwork of Rembrandt, and we say, yeah, that's got the light like he likes to use. And, or we can look at the creation, and we can say, God is good. He's beautiful. There's an order to what he has made. He gives us much more than what's necessary even it seems. There's this plenitude that he brought about. You know, we could all look the same, and it would not be boring, but there's this diversity, and yet there is this, this unity that we are called to. So Bonifinger says, you know, everything's got a trace of God in it. It's, it points to its creator. It points to the origin but then there are those intellectual creatures that are made in his image. That's you and I. And that human beings are the only creatures on this earth that can know and love the creator. Animals operate by instinct primarily, but it is human beings who have the ability planted in them to be able to know respond with faith and to love the one who has created them. And so we have these faculties of memory, intellect, and will that we can know the past. We can somewhat project the future. We have an intellect by which we can know the truth. We can know the truth of who God is. And we have a will by which we can love and we can choose, choose what is good. So he says there's a trace in everything that we 
human beings are made in his image, so we have this intellectual, rational ability that we're able to both know and love the one who's created us. And then the likeness comes by being more conformed to his will. So by God's grace that we're transformed or we're even increasing in that union and, and likeness to the one who has made us. So that's what grace does. There's a trace in all things. We're all human beings are made in his image with the ability to know and love him. But as we conform our lives, then that likeness grows. And we're able to enter into this more deeply, this covenant with the God who has made us. Finally, when we think about the six days of creation, which point again to that hierarchy of being, of which man is a crown of that creation, made in his image and likeness. And then the seventh day, God rested. And what that points to is also that we're called to worship the God who has made us. That we can't really realize our, ourselves, who we are as human beings. We can't really be happy, satisfied, unless we acknowledge and worship the God who has created us. But then also that there's an eighth day. What is the eighth day? Well, the eighth day is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. So for the Jewish people, they would celebrate the Sabbath on Saturday, but it was our Lord who rose on the eighth day. He begins the new creation, the new creation in his grace. That's why we worship on Sundays. So how wonderful we are to be inheritors of our cultural heritage, our Judeo-Christian heritage. May God help us to preserve it, to love it, and to grow in that love of God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.